Hi, everyone. We'll be starting in a minute, but uh, please remember to mute yourself and turn off your video if you want to. Um, we are recording, but we're going to try not to record that part of it, but just in case. And periodically, we'll go through and mute you uh, unless we're during the Q&A period. So during Q&A, you can unmute yourselves if you want to chat, but we'll probably mute you the rest of the time just to reduce background noise. And I'm going to stop streaming my face, uh, not only so you don't see me gesticulating all over the place, but also to save a little bit on bandwidth and hope that uh, the audio quality stays high. So we'll be starting in about one and a half, two minutes. All right, it's 12 o'clock, and can you hear me okay? Someone uh, type in the chat if you're hearing me all right. Okay, I got some good and yeses. Okay, excellent. I'm only going to uh, be on video for this short bit, then I'm gonna turn it off to save bandwidth. But just to so show you I'm a real person at home, stuck at home, just like the rest of you. <laughs> We're, this is the, the April Advance Your Research. Thank you and welcome to the <laughs> a, a webinar that was actually originally intended to be a webinar. We're gonna be talking about the open science framework. Uh, don't be intimidated by the science part of that. It's actually good for any discipline. And I'm gonna try to put in some bits about how you can use this, especially now during work from home and uh, social distancing. I'm Nina Exner. I'm the research data librarian. You are welcome to contact me by email. My email is on the screen, nexner at vcu.edu. We are, I and all of the librarians are still available. We're doing chat and video consultations and uh, all the stuff we usually do, we're just doing it at a distance. So we can't provide you with a table to do your work at, but otherwise the librarians are, are here to help you during this exciting, thrilling time. And one of the ways we can do that is helping you manage your data, which is what I'm talking about today. So when you're working with data, um, and especially when you're working in an environment that's not your usual network environment, not your usual location, uh, there's a lot of stuff that you want to think about to to preserve your data, to share your data across your teams or with your dissertation advisors or in your lab. Um, 
there are a lot of different things that you may want to keep in mind. Some of the most important ones are being able to keep it organized and maintaining different levels of security access so that the right people can get in and the wrong people don't get in and preserving it so that when you get back into the office, when you get back into the lab, uh, when you graduate from your master's or your PhD and you go out into the job world and you want to publish an article, the data is still there for you to work with, even if you have uh, lost access to an account because you've changed institutions, even if you uh, drop a USB drive in a puddle while you're trying to move your computer back to the lab. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you want to think about backing up, organizing, and securing your data. And we're going to talk about how you can do that with OSF. So there are a lot of different challenges that, uh, especially as we've moved in the last two, three decades, uh, no, three, four, three or four decades, I'm sorry, I'm dating myself there. Um, as we've moved more online, there are a lot of things that we want to think about. One of them is sharing some parts of our research and keeping other parts of our research private. A lot of times you may want to share your data openly alongside your thesis or dissertation or article so that people can look at the data and see what good quality it is for themselves. So they don't just have to take your word for it. They can dig into the data and say, oh, there's really some good stuff here, uh, way more than what you were able to put in your graphs and tables. I'm excited about this. We also want to be able to, to tell what version is the current version of our data. You've all probably had the experience of emailing an article or a draft article or paper to your advisor and the advisor sends you back a revision and it becomes revision one and then you change it back as revision two and then you think it's the final one, it becomes final, but then they have some more edits that you didn't expect and now it's final version one edition 2.3.5 and it becomes hard after a while to tell which version is the right version. Uh, we also want to make it easy to cite our research because once you are an academic you uh, <laughs> you want to be able to develop your CV and your data is its own kind of information object that you can put on your CV or your resume and to do that you want to be able to cite it and track it. You want to keep your documentation alongside your data so that people who are looking at your variables can tell exactly what variable you're, uh, you're talking about and what that variable means. And you really want to do that somewhere where it'll stay with you the long term because USBs, laptops, uh, hard drives, external hard drives are very fragile. They can be dropped, they can be lost, they can be stolen, they can just stop working because computers are like that. So there's a lot of stuff that you want to sort of think about when you're researching for the long term, which most of you are. Some of you may be researching for the long term for the first time. Those of you that are doing your very first article or thesis or dissertation, this might be the first time that you've had to think about a research project that spans a year or more. And that plus something we call the reproducibility crisis, which I'm not going to go into too much, um, but those principles of organization and preservation uh, and sharing of data combined with the reproducibility crisis to make people want to create a platform that everyone could use to make their, re their research and their data more preservable and more usable. And that was OSF. VCU is one of the highest users of OSF, Open Science Framework. Uh, Center for Open Science is over at UVA but anyone can use the open science framework for free and you get unlimited storage as long as you don't try to put up more than five gigs at a time. 
I'm going to go over some features that I think are useful for OSF, and then I'm going to get more into a kind of discussion about it. So one of the things that people always ask me about OSF is, uh, will anyone be able to accidentally find my research? And you have control over whether it's private or public. There's a button, you can see the screenshot here, that you have to hit to make it public. It starts out private, and then at some point you can choose to make an article, maybe a poster presentation, a data set. You can choose to switch that to public. Or you can create a view only link the way that you might link a Google fo folder or Google document. Um, but OSF is much more private than Google is. You can control project access and each part of your project, we're going to talk about something called components. Um, a component is a section of a project. Each project and each component in a project can have different permissions. You can give people administrative rights to be able to move files around, or you can give them only reading and write rights so that they can look at things, they can comment on it, they can make changes, but they can't delete things, they can't get rid of things or you can let them view only. And all of this has uh, security certificates in the VCU data security parlance. We rate it as ca for category two data. So that means you can't use it for health data without de-identifying the personal health data, but you can use it for the sort of mid-level human subjects data. So if you're doing a survey, if you're doing an interview where it's not super secure, it's not like a, an issue of using illegal drugs or working with children or one of those very sensitive areas, you can usually use it for human identifiable uh, human subjects research. It has a persistent short URL, like this one that I have the picture of at the top here, osf.io, and then a little code. If I copy that URL now and I go back to it in 20 years, that same URL is going to get me back to the same project. So it's a long-term or, or what we call persistent address. You can also create a citation. It's going to automatically make one with the author that created the project. Usually that's gonna be you. But you can also customize what it will look like and you can choose which contributors are authors and which aren't. So you could, for example, when you're working on your dissertation, you could let your advisor have read access to the whole dissertation without getting credit on the citation but then maybe you write one article with your advisor as part of your dissertation research and you put that in its own component and you could set a citation in that that does have your advisor as an author. So you can really control the citations and uh, the different sections, how they would appear when people put that in their references to help build your reputation. One of the best things about OSF is it's got pretty easy versioning. And versioning is what we call it when you make an edit and it becomes a new copy, like using track changes in, in Word, but it identifies which version is the most recent one and also lets you step, step backwards to the previous versions. So you can always go back to your first addition of a certain spreadsheet, a certain document, in case you're like, oh, I remember I did this at one point, but now it's not there. When did it disappear? Where did it go? You can step back through all the old versions of spreadsheets in case you accidentally delete or overwrite something. That's really common with data analysis is for people to overwrite, accidentally overwrite something. Um, there are lots of ways that people can 
can accidentally remove a column or take out some formulas and all of a sudden the spreadsheet doesn't work right and you can't figure out what happened so you can't fix it. If you have versioned that spreadsheet, you can step back through the old copies until you find one that works. Uh, that way you never lose your data and that's one of the most essential parts of data management is maintaining all the different versions of a spreadsheet or an SPSS file or, or whatever you're working with so that you, you've never lost anything when you overwrite it. There's always the older version to go back to. So this, this is my absolute favorite part of OSF is this versioning. Um, when you share in OSF, it sends the people you share to an email. So you can see I've got an example of my invitation to a project that I sent to Dr. Fubar. Um, I added Dr. Fubar as a read-write contributor to my project called Working Data. And Dr. Fubar, you can guess from that name, this is a made-up person. Dr. Fubar got this email that lets them go to the project and tells them how to change their settings. And then in my project, it says, oh, hey, Dr. Fubar has made a change. Dr. Fubar has made some edits. That's where this is going to be super helpful for your social distancing, your work from home. Because every time someone adds a file or updates a file to a new version, you get an email and it tracks the activity in OSF. So if you've just had to pivot from everyone working in the same lab and being able to go to the bench and just say, oh, hey, did you make an edit to that thing I sent you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I made that change in the Google Doc. Didn't you look and see it? Every time Google Docs gets a little edit, it doesn't necessarily give you a warning. OSF is going to tell you every time so that you can track through all these changes. So that's especially useful when you're taking your research to everyone being in different locations. So you can't just drop in and say, hey, did you, did you make some changes? Did you make those edits that I asked about? So that's one of the things that I think is really going to be, really going to make OSF a game changer in this work from home environment. So I mentioned those bullets for research challenges. How do we share thing, some things and keep others private? By using components in OSF to change what becomes public data, what gets shared limited to just a team, and what's private to me only. How do I figure out what version of the document this is? Uh, I, to make a revision, I upload the revised copy to the same location and the same file name, and it will just add a new version and call it version two, version three, version four. How do we make research easier to cite? The persistent universal URLs, I can always copy that URL, that short URL, and get back to the same place. How do I keep my documentation with my data? There's a wiki tool that I'll show you where I can add some basic readme information or sort of landing page information. I can also upload any documents that I want and it'll put it all together in the same project and let me organize it. And if you're writing maybe uh, for a grant, a data management plan, and you want to know how long this data is good for, the long-term plan for OSF includes 50 years of preservation. It's in the cloud and we have it uh, security authorized for category two and category three data. If you're not sure what I'm talking about with category two and category three data, then consider checking the DMS, the data management system at dms.vcu.edu and that'll help you uh, kind of go through the different security categories that IT has for data security. That's also really helpful if you're doing your IRB or, or your IACUC. 
So at, one of the things as a data management librarian that I work with people a lot on is the organization of their data. And the biggest tip that I can give you is instead of just storing things wherever is convenient to put them in, think about what you're going to try to retrieve to pull the content out. Are you writing a dissertation where you're really just using one project? Or are you going to write several articles and want to handle it as many projects? Are you working in a lab where you have a lot of different deliverables, different grants, articles, specific aims within the grants, different people leading each project. Um, when it's very complicated, like organizing your whole lab, a lot of times there you want to maybe come together and create some sort of shared approach to how you organize your projects so that everyone can uh, be on the same page and have a plan. But thinking about how you're going to retrieve things back out will give you a, a hint as to what that organization might look like, whether everything should be in one project with lots of subfolders or whether you want to have lots of different folders and different projects and then link them together under a sort of master lab project. Easier input usually means harder to retrieve when you're writing up your articles and trying to, uh, trying to make your tables and your charts and your graphs. It takes a little bit more work to get it in if you want to get it easy out. So if you're in a big hurry right now and you don't have time, uh, maybe you're working on viral research and everything is in a big hurry right now because viral research is, is uh, critical to understanding COVID. You don't have time to, to organize your data, but I'm going to warn you up front that if you're going easy in, it's going to be hard to retrieve. Um, so there's always a trade-off. Where, where do you want to save your time, now or later? So the key to setting up OSF is the components. And I'm going to show you what a project looks like. I'll be coming back to this project. This is a project of called Training Project Dissertation. So I'm at the top of this project now. And it has components over here on the side that are subsections of it. When I look at the files, I have storage that's directly under the project, but I then have more sets of storage on the side here that go with each of my components. So you can see I have a component listed on the right that's called working data. And I have a section on the left under files that's called working data. So a component is a part of a project. I'm gonna go back to my slide deck, but we'll be coming back to this project in a moment. Those components drive how you set up your permissions. So when you set one part to private and one part to shared, uh, the parts that you can set are components and each component can have its own permissions. So setting who's an author, who's a who's a contributor or author, who can see my file, how I want to have my permissions, and making a section public for open or shared data, all of those things are done component by component. So when you're making a plan for an OSF project, you want to think about which sections may need different authoring or different security permissions. If a certain section is going to need different permission, then you want to make a component inside of the project. 
that's that's where OSF really gets a lot different from working in Google Drive. So when you first make a project, you want to think about what kind of permissions you're going to be giving, what kind of security and sharing you're going to need. Will you be sharing the whole project or do you only want to share parts of the project? So if I'm making a dissertation, do I want to show all of the sections of the dissertation to my advisor so that they can go through everything in my work process? Or do I want to have some of the project, the dissertation project, visible to my advisor and some of it private for my own kind of personal noodling around? It's a little easier to just dump everything in one project and share the whole thing, but then everyone can see it. If I want to control it, then sharing only parts is going to give me that control, but I have to set up the components in advance before I start sharing. When I share components, if my whole lab is all using Open Science Framework, the people it's shared with are going to get the components named however I named them. So right now I've got a little screenshot on the side of what Dr. Fubar sees when I share things and I've shared one project's component called data and another project's component called working data with Dr. Fubar. And there's no way to easily tell looking here which is with which, um, with which project, because all I called the component was data. So if you or your advisor or your lab use OSF a lot, you may need to give the components detailed names like Exner data and Lee data and Kim data, all of the different people's names um, to help show which set of data is which. Uh, otherwise, it's going to get confusing as you share it and people get all the different components looking the same. Some of you, um, a lot of you actually work in labs. As, as I looked through the subject areas I saw of, of the attendees, I saw a lot of, um, a lot of lab-based, bench-based subjects. So if you're thinking of organizing a whole lab's data, uh, especially as you're transferring from working physically in the lab to having to work uh, virtually, you may want to do some storyboarding or some, um, some sort of brainstorming of organization before you set up your OSF. Uh, so you might have people put a lot of post-it notes or virtual post-it notes of all the different topics that they're working on. Just put up a lot of topics and brainstorm out all the different specific aims, all the different data sets, all the different projects that you're working on. So you can see on the left in my imaginary project, we're looking on rutabaga extract and turnip extract and the turnipology study. Turnipology is not a real word. Um, so we're, we're brainstorming all the different specific aims within this turnipology research. Um, and then on the right, after having brainstormed the different data sets I'm working with, the lab could come together and group them up, uh, whether you're doing it with physical post-it notes or with virtual post-it notes like I have here, group it up and say, okay, the, I've got one group here, uh, the Southeast, oop, I clicked when I shouldn't have, the Southeast term, Turnipology Study, and it includes these uh, national turnipology and cleaned turnipology data sets and a turnipology systematic review. But then I've got the separate micronutrient study and someone's specific dissertation, Mbali's specific dissertation, and then a couple of extract data sets. 
And then I have a separate project that's kind of new, that's not attached to any of them, this Brassica self-efficacy scale. Um, and by grouping these up, I can say, oh, well, now this lab, really in my lab here, after we brainstorm and then we move our post-it notes to group them up, I think we've got three projects. Uh, Southeast Turnipology Study, the Micronutrient Study, and the self-efficacy scale. So if you're working with a lab and your whole lab wants to come together to organize your data, I, I really strongly suggest some storyboarding or some, some post-it note brainstorming. I did these virtual post-it notes in um, Google Jamboard. You have access to Google Jamboard through your VCU, um, your VCU IT infrastructure, your, your Google Drive with your vcu.edu or vcuhealth.edu email address. And so that's a, a place that you could go to do some of this storyboarding and brainstorming. When you set up, when you go into your OSF, you have this toolbar at the top that names the project and gives you the different tools that you can work on. Your files, your wiki, your analytics, if you share any of it to public data, registrations, contributors. This is where you do most of your activities and I'll come back to it, but I wanna go show you the different sections of the landing page before I go into the specific functions. So we start with the toolbar at the top. Then the wiki lets you put some landing information. And uh, sometimes people will keep going with this wiki and make it quite long to take all of their lab minutes or create an entire code book. Um, a good thing to put on the wiki might be a readme file with an explanation of how the different files relate to each other. So there's lots of things you can put in the wiki, uh, just any kind of documentation, and that will keep it with the files. If you share a public section, a lot of times a readme or initial landing information of what new people coming from the internet should be expecting in this project would be what you want to put in the wiki. And that's what I've put here. Uh, what is this? pretend lab about and what would you want to uh, what would you want to expect to see here to the right is the components and linked projects one of the cool things is that you can link existing projects in so uh, if I start working on my dissertation and I'm using it in OSF and I share it with my advisor an advisor says oh hey actually I really think everyone should do this I don't have to go back and move things from my dissertation project to a shared project that my PI sets up I can link the project that I made, I can link it into the lab or the group project that um, that my whole team might set up. So I can kind of retcon or or change retroactively convert my project individual projects into links within an umbrella project. Um, the file storage, which is probably really what most of you are interested in. Uh, the rest of this discussion is context around it. The file storage is drag and drop. You can put as many files as you want to. You can put any kind of file, as long as it's not category one, highly secured and private HIPAA type health information. You can put any kind of file in here. So you can put spreadsheets and uh, MATLAB, of uh, uh, simulations or models. You can put Word documents. You can put your 200 page dissertation, all different kinds of things in the storage. So you have unlimited free storage. Now um, I'm going to go from there to a demo to show you how that plays out in 
real life, but let me pause real quick and ask if you have any questions so far. I know it, uh, OSF, unfortunately, is one of those tools that's a little bit better in live demo than it is um, as a webinar, but we're all in this virtual environment now, so uh, webinar is, is pretty much how it goes for all of us. But it, do you have any questions, uh, things that I've just totally skipped or I need to clarify right now? Go on, throw them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. All right, not seeing any. I'm going to go on and demo. Ah, do you, uh, did get one, thank you. Do you need to set up a wiki first or set up a wiki when you're setting up your project in OSF? OSF uh, project first, set up an OSF project and then you can start putting in the wiki. So it's always gonna be project first. All right, so I am in this dissertation pr training project. I've put a lot of information here in the wiki. And when I hit the wiki, it's going to give me the longer description. So on the landing page, I'm only gonna get a little piece of wiki but the read more or the pop out button will let me see the whole thing. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of people will use this um, to make a lab notebook or at least sort of lab meeting minutes and may end up taking a very long set of notes in the wiki. You wouldn't want that to to push everything else off the landing page. So that's why you only get a little tiny piece of wiki here and then the read more to get to more. File storage is under here and I'm going to show you what happens when I'm working with a file. So if I go into my spreadsheet data cleaning .csv, when I click on that in the files window, if it's a simple file type, um, Word documents, PDFs, spreadsheets that are either CSV spreadsheets or some Excel, uh, but it depends on how much formatting you added to the Excel spreadsheets, it'll give you a little preview. But even if it can't preview it where you can look at it online, you can still store it. So for example, it's not gonna be able to preview um, SAS files, but I could still store a SAS file and download it. So even if I can't preview it, any file can be put in here and downloadable for everyone in the, the group and versioned. You can see my spreadsheet has version four listed here. If I click on version four, it's going to show me, okay, the first three revisions Nina Exner uploaded it. Nina Exner uploaded a new version. Nina Exner uploaded another new version. And then Dr. Fubar, which is actually me, but in a different pretend account, Dr. Fubar uploaded the fourth version. So I can see who made each revision and uh, kind of audit through those. And I can download the older versions if I say, oh, you know, Dr. Fubar, I noticed that you deleted um, column three. Did you mean to do that? Uh, not that any PI would ever accidentally delete when they're moving in a rush between one class and another. But just in case, uh, you can go back and revert to version three and make your changes from there. So this is a re really the best part of working with OSF. If I'm on the files page and I make a new copy of datacleaning.csv, 
of course it's going to take make wait a minute while it opens up i should have had this opened in advance if i make some additions So maybe I verify response number two, save it. And then I can just drag and drop. Oh, drag and drop on the word storage, which is going to misbehave because it hates Zoom. Hmm. That's annoying. Let me see if it works better from the landing page. It does work better from the landing page. If, if uh, you've been watching your PIs and your faculty members muddle through things on Zoom and complaining a lot that things are not behaving the way they expect, the, the interface with Zoom causes some other online interface <laughs> things to freak out because it can't tell whether you're trying to interact with Zoom or interact with the web page. And so it's, it, it's not entirely <laughs> the faculty member not being used to, to working online. I just feel like I have to, to defend people on that. Okay, so I just dumped it down onto the storage and now you can see version five and the addition I made in the notes field has showed up in my preview. When I look at the versions list, you'll see, okay, nine Exner, changed something after Dr. Fubar changed it. And now I'm gonna go back up to the dissertation training project. So all my storage is over here. You can see though that I've got these separate components under here. And let's say I'm working with a document I've decided, okay, my drafts are mature enough. I'm ready to show Dr. Fubar my dissertation document, the, the, not just the data, but the actual writing part. I'm finally willing to say, okay, have at it, boss. You can take a look at it now. I'm ready for you. I'm gonna go into the component that I want to share and go to contributors in the toolbar. And I can add a contributor. This is one of the things I don't like about OSF. You have to search by name or you have to know something that's in their profile. Uh, fortunately, there's only one FUBAR uh, spelled in the computer science style of FUBAR instead of the uh, military style of, of spelling FUBAR. And I know that that's my FUBAR. So I can, when I find Dr. Fubar, I hit the plus and it adds it. And then it lets me decide, do I want to let them just read it, read and make changes, or read, make changes, and delete files, move files around, add components, uh, do everything that I can do, or be the administrator. Now, if you're doing this, I, I know some of your research staff, if you're doing this for a whole lab, a lot of people may be making changes. I suggest having at least two administrators, uh, your research administrator or lab coordinator and the PI um, or postdoc or whoever is usually the, the wrangler of computer stuff for the lab. Um, but if it's just you as a graduate student working, and, and that's who the main audience of this webinar is, so if it's just you working with your advisor and on your dissertation, I would not suggest to make them an administrator. I would just give them read and write. And then if you also want to share it with someone that you want to be able to take a look at it and maybe give you some verbal feedback, but you don't want them making changes to it, then you give them read permission. I'm going to leave Dr. Fubar with read and write. This middle bibliographic contributor checkbox uh, affects whether that person becomes an author in the bibliography. I'm going to leave them off. Well, no, I'll put them on and go to next. 
and pick which components I want to put them in and add them on. So now you can see Dr. Fubar has read and write permission and is a bibliographic contributor to the component documents. And when I come back to documents, my citation is going to say Exner and Fubar, and it's going to continue on with the date and the name of the component and where it was retrieved on. If I change the contributor to remove Dr. Fubar as a bibliographic contributor, then when I go to documents and look at the citation, Fubar is off of the authoring list. So one of the reasons you might change a make a component is to be able to affect these authoring credits uh, when you share something. There should be a lot of thought around authoring if it's a component you're going to make public. So if you're going to put a poster up, you're going to publish uh, an open data set to go with an article, you really want to think about who you put in as an author. Uh, and you probably want to have that conversation with your advisor when they put something up um, about whether you're going to get credit and what order the credit should go in. That's just, it's, it's never a bad idea to talk about that before actually spinning something up and, and putting the authors on. So you can see here, everything that I just did here has been reflected in my recent activity. So I added Dr. Fubar as a contributor, and then I went back and removed them as a contributor. Um, earlier, I linked a Mendeley folder in here. This is a cool thing that you can do in OSF. You can link what they call add-ons. That's up here in the toolbar under add-ons. You can link in other functions. So you can add a Google Drive folder. You can add a OneDrive folder. You can add Mendeley or Zotero folders that you're organizing your literature review in. Um, there's a lot of different add-ons that you can put in. I'm going to go to add-ons really quickly. If you want, if you think you're going to want to use these a lot, you can Google OSF add-ons video and the, the Center for Open Science has made videos on how to use the add-ons. Most of the add-ons are for storage. So you've got Box and Dataverse and Dropbox and Figshare. You've got a couple of tools for code versioning, although both Python and R allow direct integration with OSF. Uh, there's, there's OSFR and OSFPy packages, but you can also integrate your GitHub or GitLabs. And then citation software, Mendeley and Zotero can both be linked in. Uh, and so if you're using OSF to organize your dissertation, you can have all of your Mendeley in, uh, for a dissertation folder and subfolders inside that folder. You can have an entire Mendeley or Zotero folder linked in. Uh, so that's pretty spiffy. And then you can also see whatever the linked document was. Uh, so this is a good way for you to be able to work through your literature review in a shared kind of way. Um, without having to go through 15 different different uh, folders, which is one of the problems, of course, that we get into with, with labs is we end up with, we've got these, these emails here, we've got the Slack channel there, we've got a Google Drive, but the stuff with the health system, we're working in OneDrive, and we end up with things all over the place. So one of the things you can do with OSF is pull everything together through the add-ons 
so there's one common landing page to get to all of the different parts. If I want to make a new project, I can go to my projects and it's going to list all the projects that I've ever been added to, which is a lot, mostly they're training projects. Um, once I'm in my projects, and by the way, you can make your OSF account either using your EID and single sign-on, or um, you can make it with a separate email, you can add your separate email into it. Do remember that Google Drive through your VCU account is more secure than Google Drive through your Gmail, uh, your fr a free Gmail account. So be very cognizant of what storage you link in with the add-ons. But as far as setting up a username and password, you can either set it up through single sign-on with your EID, or you can set it up as an OSF uh, account directly with, if you don't want it linked. Maybe you're in your last semester and you're about to leave. You don't want it linked to the email account that you're about to lose. So in that case, you probably want to use a different email. It's free either way. But if you want it to be the single sign-on so that you're only having to remember the one password, then you, uh, when you set it up, you'll want to go through the institution. All right, so I'm on my, my projects page. And if I want to make a new one, I create a project. And I'm going to call it AYR because we're in the Advanced Year Research webinar today. I can add a project description. I can also use a template. This is mostly useful for any of you who may uh, be supporting a lab where everyone is kind of doing very similar experiments but with, with different data. You may want to set up one. Uh, one project and then keep duplicating it to have the same components, the same folders, the same uh, options all set up through it so you don't have to remake it over and over. I am not going to use a template, I'm just going to make it empty. And once it creates my project, I can go to new project. And this looks very similar to the one I was just showing you a minute ago, but there's nothing but prompts here. One of the things that I um, have trouble with with OSF is it's a little hard to know what to do when I get here and I've got this empty set of boxes with kind of nothing in it. Um, I would generally suggest starting either with making files in the storage or making components if you know you're going to have different organization uh, systems to work with. If you know that you're going to end up having some people have permissions for the documents and other people have permissions for the data. Maybe everyone can write documents, but you have an undergraduate researcher who you want to be able to edit the documents and upload new files, but you don't want them to be able to make changes to a certain data set because they're not really working with it and you're worried about uh, too many people making edits to it, then you would start with making the components to share one part and not another. If, you, if everyone's gonna have the same permission though, it's probably best to start with making folders in the files. Um, and I've clicked on, I clicked on OSF storage, but you would, when you start out, you would not have that open. When you click on a section that says storage, you're gonna have these options appear. Again, that's not intuitive. So you come in and it looks like this. And you come over here to files, but there's no obvious way to file anything. You have to click on storage for it to give the option to either upload a file or create a folder in the storage. So maybe I want to say drafts. I've got one folder for drafts. And I might make another folder for figures. 
those folders will start appearing here under storage in the, the project name. Now I mentioned having separate data. If I make a component inside of this project, it'll ask me if I want to have the same contributors. I haven't added any contributors, so I'm just going to create it. Now, when I've added that component over here in the files, it's made a, a section with that component's name and a new storage option. So maybe I have raw data and uh, cleaned data. So you can see on the left that the organization, leap, the organization of the, the components gets mirrored or, or replicated or, or it looks the same as in the organization of the storage sections. So as I add these components, they appear in the file section. I can drag and drop. Of course, I didn't make a storage folder for codebooks, so I'm just going to drop it on top. And when I drag and drop my files, they upload where I have dropped them. If I want to see this file, I click on it. I just dropped it, so it's going to say version one. And because it's a Word document, it'll let me preview it. If I want to add contributors, well, let me do the wiki really quickly. Um, if I want to make edits to the wiki, I go to the, um, the symbol that looks like a box with an arrow, and it's going to give me a writing and a preview. If I just want to make changes to it, um, it's a little hard to read, and that's why you've got the preview, because it's using something called Markdown. So it's going to add the Markdown um, modifiers, the, the tags and symbols that change how my Markdown looks. It's going to add those as I go, but I can always watch what's happening with the preview here. So this is, can be a little bit awkward to work with. I'm just hitting keys on my, on my keyboard now. Um, but if you watch the preview, you can, you can always see what's going on. All right. I want to just hit the, I'm going to go back to my landing page. I want to hit the contributors. And then uh, I've got a few minutes for questions. But if you have questions, type them in the chat now while I'm showing how to do the contributors. I already showed you the contributors once. I'm just going to do it in this new one, so I'm doing it from scratch. To add contributors to this project, I go in and type the name. Oh, my caps lock is on. The names I'm looking for, and I may have to look through a lot of them if it's something like Smith. I'm going to make Dr. Fubar an administrator. And now we've got two administrators. Because I was in the demo data component, it's added Dr. Fubar to this component. But my main project is still just me contributing to it. So if you have a dissertation where you want to keep some of most of it private to yourself, but you've got like a, a drafts ready to go component that you're willing to share, then you could 
you could do it the way I've got it set it up here. Like most of this is pro is private, and anything I drop in this AYR OSF storage is private to me. But this one section is shared, and so my advisor can see just that there. And my recent activity is going to be separate for each each project and each component. So when I'm in this one, you can see I added the wiki, I added Dr. Fubar, I uploaded a file in this section. All right, um, no one's put anything in the chat yet, but add on any questions that you might have in the chat and I'll read them out. I'll also say this was a tour with some thoughts on uh, how you might do it for organizing your lab or dissertation, but OSF is really much better hands-on. So uh, <laughs> you've, you've had a preview of it, but uh, if you think you might be interested, but the summary is still kind of like, eh, I'm not sure please feel free to set up a, an appointment with me for consultation or training with your lab uh, or with you individually and we can walk through it. It's, it's, it's definitely a tool that's, that suffers in, in, uh, in tour mode and is, is much better in hands-on mode. All right, I'm not seeing any chats. I am seeing a lot of people log off. I'm gonna end the recording, but if you have further, uh, further questions, please feel free to let me know. Mm -hmm.